Dear friends and fellow travelers, with the forthcoming event in Ayodhya on January the 22nd, the atmosphere here in Delhi, already famous for being polluted in a material sense, has thickened to a spiritually poisonous and unbreathable concentrate of Hindu chauvinism, malice and bullying. I am deeply anguished by all this as an Indian and as a Hindu. And after thinking hard about what I can do, I have decided to go on a fast starting tomorrow, Saturday the 20th and ending on Tuesday the 23rd, a day after the January 22nd production at Ayodhya. <clears throat> I am doing this first and foremost as an expression of my love and sorrow to my Muslim fellow citizens of India. I cannot let this moment pass without saying as loud as I can to my Muslim brothers and sisters that I love you and that I condemn and repudiate what is being done in the name of Hinduism and nationalism in Ayodhya. I am also doing this as an expression of my love for my Mughal heritage. This is not only about feeling protective towards someone else. It is about my culture and my ethos. I love Dhrupad and Khayal music. I love Kathak. I love the Mughal and Sultanate buildings in my city of Delhi. I cannot imagine Delhi without the Qutub Minar or Humayun's tomb or the Sabz Burj not to mention the Taj Mahal next door in Agra. I revel the magnificent culture spawned by the court of Awadh under Nawab Wajid Ali Shah. I see the Delhi Sultanate as also having given something precious to India, as it was with them that the Sufis and Amir Khusro's father came here. <clears throat> in North India, we owe so much of our language and culture to Hazrat Amir Khusro. He adopted Hindavi into a language of poetry, which later spawned the grand languages of Hindi and Urdu. He made innovations in music that laid the foundation of Shastriya Sangeet, the classical music of North India, of which we are all so proud. The list is endless. There is no part of our high classical culture in North India, which does not bear the stamp of the Sultanate, the Mughals, the Nawabs and the Nizams. This is not to say that any of these traditions were the sole product of these rulers or that it was Muslims that enlightened us. On the contrary, this culture is the result of the mingling of the native arts, traditions and languages with those that were brought by the Sultans and the Mughals. A mingling which only happened because of the embrace by them of the existing culture <clears throat> Can we speak of Amir Khusro's music without speaking of Gopal Nayak, the famous Hindu court musician from whom Khusro learnt so much? Can we speak of Hindustani classical music or Kathak without speaking of the Dhruvapadas or the Rasas of the Natya Shastra? Can we speak of Tansen without speaking of Pandit Haridas? Can we have Kathak without the traditions of the Ras Leela and the performance of the Ramayana and the Mahabharata in India from times immemorial? Can we have Dhrupad without the worship of Lord Shiva? Can we have Dhamar without Holi? Read the writings of Abul Fazl, the court biographer of Akbar. See how he sings praises of Hindu beliefs, practices, sciences and philosophies. Do you know that Akbar commissioned a Persian translation of the Mahabharata to showcase what a great culture the Hindus had? And he was such an admirer of the Mahabharata that when the translation was read to him, he scoffed and said that it was not good enough. Look up the work that Nawab Wajid Ali Shah did with Kathak compositions, dance dramas and poetry. They were all inspired by the traditional celebration of Radha Krishna by his Hindu subjects. This is not meant to be a lecture in history, so I will stop here. But the examples go on and on. And I have given them to explain that when I say that I love my Mughal heritage, I am saying that I love the composite culture that grew out of the Hindu and Muslim traditions of this land. 
a culture in which you cannot pick out what is Muslim and what is Hindu anymore, or what was native and what was foreign. It has been a millennium, a millennium of intermingling and of reciprocal inspiration and admiration. Influences are from everywhere. This is not an imposition of foreign things. It is how a culture develops in conversation with other languages, other aesthetic traditions, other faiths and other philosophies. The dramatic form that is described in the Natya Shastra emerged from a culture that branched out of the encounter of the subcontinent with the Greeks. Are you going to throw that out also? If you keep throwing things out by calling them foreign or not Hindu, then what will we be left with? The culture that grew under the Mughal Empire was not imposed. It was not developed anywhere else. It grew from here, from this soil, and is unique to this land. And let me tell you that I do not consider my only heritage to be Mughal. I come from a mixed background of Tamil Brahmin and Punjabi Sikh, and I love and cherish all those parts of my heritage too. My husband has mixed Rajasthani Jat and Jat Sikh heritage with a family history in the military, and I have been delighted to adopt his legacy with all his tales of valor and chivalry as my own. In the work that I do helping Indian families abroad whose children have been snatched by cruel foreign child services agencies, I inevitably end up learning about the culture and religion that they come from. And I found that they would seep into me. From my Bengali families, I was introduced to Madurga, whom I now celebrate with as much joy as my Bengali friends. From a recent case involving a Jain family, I have been intrigued enough to start studying some Jain scriptures. And this behavior, this pattern, this life history is not unique to me. It is repeated in countless Indians of all ethnic and religious backgrounds all over the country for centuries. Hindutvavadis insist that you need one religion, one culture and one language to develop a coherent identity. It is simply not true. You can equally develop a cosmopolitan and porous identity. It is not a question of what you exclude or include, but of values and of conviction. And this is not some new modern idea. India has always been a land of diversity and these questions of identity, community, authenticity and social division have always been there. And we have always been faced with a choice to be open or closed. This is a conversation going back millennia. Emperor Ashok in the 3rd century BC said, Piyadasi Raja Sarvata Ichati Save Pasandava Seyu Save Te Sayamam Cha Bhav Sudhim Cha Ichati It is always my wish, he said, for persons of all faiths to live on my lands. For they all essentially believe in good thinking and good conduct. Puje teyatu eva parapasanda tena tena prakaranena. Find numerous ways of honoring those of other beliefs. Evam hi devanam pias itcha kimti savapasanda bahusruta cha asu kalanagama cha asu bahusruta kalanagama. It is the desire of the king that you should be broad of knowledge and seek to understand others' beliefs. Cultivate an attitude of friendliness and openness to all. This is the 3rd century BC. It's not some Western imposed idea. It's one of the greatest samrats that India ever saw. Two millennia later, in the 16th century, Emperor Akbar is saying the same thing. He is a man who makes justice his guide on the path of inquiry and takes from every belief what is consonant with reason. Perhaps in this way, the lock whose key has been lost may be opened. Notwithstanding that at all periods of time, this is from the Aine Akbari, Hindustan has never been lacking in prudent men with excellent resolutions and well-intentioned designs. 
There are misunderstandings and quarrels between its different religions. Through the apathy of princes, each sect is bigoted to its own creed, and dissensions have waxed high. Each one regarding his own persuasion alone is true as true, has set himself to the persecution of other worshippers of God. Sounds familiar? Were the eyes of the mind possessed of true vision, each individual would withdraw from this indiscriminating turmoil and attend rather to his own solicitudes than interfere in the concerns of others, so that dissensions within and without can be turned to peace and the thorn break of strife bloom into a garden of concord. 500 years later, Gandhiji says the same thing. The essence of true religious teaching is that <clears throat> one should serve and befriend all. I learnt this on my mother's lap. You may refuse to call me a Hindu. I know no defence except to quote a line from Iqbal's famous song, Mazhab nahi sikhata, aapas mein bear rakhna. Meaning religion does not teach us to bear ill will towards one another. So I personally have found no difficulty in embracing diverse ideas and practices while all the time thinking of myself as a Hindu. In my personal practice for my wedding or functions in my family, I have rituals conducted in the manner of my paternal grandmother as the homum is done among Tamils because personally, I prefer the way Sanskrit is pronounced by Tamil Purohits and the way the puja is done. But this is because that is how I grew, grew up seeing pujas. This does not stop me from feeling Shraddha, Aastha and gaining comfort in any place of worship, whether Nizamuddin Dargah or the Vatican or Jama Masjid or the Ganeshji Mandir built by my, my grandfather, built by my paternal grandfather here in Delhi on Baba Kharak Singh Mark or my personal favorite temple, the magnificent Brihadishwara Temple built by Raja Raja Shola in Tanjore which is a few minutes drive from my ancestral village in Tamil Nadu. I'm not an orthodox Hindu. I don't know all the mantras or observe the fast or, or the dietary taboos or pray every morning or regularly go to any temple. But I don't see the votaries of Hindutvavad as being very orthodox either. All our saffron Twitter influences, our saffron actors, our bhakt news personalities live very modern lives. They are not living the traditional orthodox Hindu way, whether in marriage, food habits, clothes or lifestyle. Even the January 22 function is not following the Hindu orthodox way. The Shankracharyas are complaining that it is not being done according to the strict traditions. For me, this is not an issue. Hinduism is not a hidebound faith. For every Shastric way of conducting some prayer, there is always an upai around it. This is the openness of Hinduism and its constant reminder to us, to Hindus, to keep the focus on the spirit of things and not on the material side, even when conducting prayers. For me, Hinduism is all the stories of our gods and goddesses which somehow define my very existence. It is like they are always present with their epic stories and great wars and loves and philosophical dialogues in an unseen but very real drama that is always going on around me and filling my inner world with color, counsel and comfort. Everything comes alive with them and becomes an offering to them. When I bow to my harmonium, or to the stage, as my Muslim Ustads have taught me, Devi Saraswati comes before my eyes. When I was exhausted and frustrated as a young mother with my naughty toddlers, it was the tales of Yashoda driven to distraction by the mischievous Krishna that gave me comfort and understanding. Feminists will start groaning when I say this, but when I gave up work to become a full-time mother, and everyone looked at me as though I was an alien. I found a wellspring of strength and self-assurance in the feminine Hindu ideal of seva, of devotion, sacrifice and service in which you forget yourself and give everything, tan man dhan. 
to serving those whom it is your duty to serve. So I am very sincere when I say that I think of myself as a Hindu. This is what Hinduism is to me. And if I am not a Hindu, or if this is not Hinduism, then you come and you say it to my face. Again and again, we are reminded by the Hindutva Vadis that the Mughals invaded us. Yes, the first Mughal came here as a conqueror. But he did not take Delhi from any Hindu ruler. Whom did Babur fight in Panipat? It was Ibrahim Lodi. Before that, he defeated Daulat Khan in Punjab. Let us be clear, the Mughals entered India with the conquest of a Muslim by a Muslim. In fact, <clears throat> it was the conquest by a Muslim of several Muslims before defeating Lodi, Babur had conquered the Afghans in Kabul. Some historians say that there might even have been proposals of an alliance between Babur and Rana Sangha, the Rajput king, to fight Ibrahim Lodi together. That alliance did not happen, but when Ibrahim Lodi was defeated by Babur, his brother joined forces with Rana Sangha in order to try and defeat Babur. So Babur's was not by any means a simple story of a Muslim conquest of India. I'm not going to say that Babur's victory here was not without its pathos. Conquest is terrible in its violence and destruction. No doubt each conquest is the end of something, the death of something. And I can imagine that there would have been an adjustment that Hindus would have had to make especially in the initial years being ruled by non-Hindus, although that adjustment would already have begun to have happened many, many years before the Mughals got here. Many, many years. Because Muslim rulers, conquerors were coming here since the 8th century and they were here by the 10th century. But the point is, that Mughal rule in India was never particularly focused on Islam. That was the time of kings and conquests. It was the age of imperialism. And it was precisely to end imperialism, to end blood feuds and war, that people turned to ideas of democracy, pluralism, secularism and pacifism. Ideas that we in India are recklessly rejecting in the name of some invasion 1000 years ago and 500 years ago. Is it not possible to say, can't we just move on from all this? The Mughals were also not the enemies of the Rajputs for all the 500 years that they ruled here. They entered into marriage alliances with Rajput kings. Some of their senior most generals and officials were Rajputs. Their clothes, architecture and culture took so much from the Rajputs. Get into your car, drive out of Delhi. And within minutes, you are in Rajput territory with their forts and palaces and temples all around. Were they erased? Were they taken over by the Mughals? No, they were right there. A stone's throw, a stone's throw from the Mughal capital. This is why the Ram Janmabhumi agitation was such a lie when it claimed to be fighting 500 years of Hindu Golami. Mughal rule was nothing like that. It was about the ambitions of kings and conquerors and neither Hinduism nor Islam played any other than an ancillary role in all this. Except for Aurangzeb, none of the Mughals were very observant. They drank wine, they consumed opium, they preferred Sufis over the ulema. Akbar was even accused of being un-Islamic. His deen -e elahi was seen as a direct challenge to the Muslim orthodoxy. Even the name that he took was objectionable to the orthodoxy because they said how can he call himself Akbar it comes from Allahu Akbar so whatever you say about the pain of Mughal invasion it did not give birth to centuries of Hindu repression or enslavement it gave birth to a beautiful culture that took nothing away from Hindu religion or Hindu culture and now we come to the vexed question of conversions and breaking of temples by invaders from today's point of view, both are wrong. But let us be clear 
first and foremost about the limits of the claimed historical wrong we are not talking about hundreds of years of repression of hinduism we are not talking about a state policy of conversion to islam we are not talking about mass building over of temples with mosques while such things did occur both before during and after the moguls it was not the policy of the moguls to convert hindus or to build temples or to break temples in india in fact they built temples patronized native arts and many of them like akbar made huge efforts in stopping religious prejudice persecution and maintaining communal harmony here so at most we are talking of a handful of mosques built hundreds of years ago on the one hand coming up in a context and a society that no longer exists here in terms of its power structures or in how a ruler is chosen and on the other hand causing hurt mistrust instability and division in the fabric of our society along the length and breadth of our country look what happened in manipur when old antagonisms were provoked there is no justification for stoking such deep and lasting social turmoil for the sake of destroying a few mosques and it never ends you heard what the karnataka bjp mp said about wanting to demolish mosques in karnataka why can't we simply say that we have better things to do than endlessly fight over mosques and build temples The worst thing about these temple agitations is the ugly feelings they provoke feelings that take us as far away as it is possible to go from religion I was about 15 years old when the Ram Janmabhoomi agitation started with LK Advani's Rath Yatra my entire school was for it my entire school there is no ugly statement about muslims that is made today that i did not hear from my fellow students in school and i will never forget the malice in their eyes and the spit dripping from their lips i will never forget the glee with which they would wave the tapes of sadvi ritambra wave the tapes which we, they would play in their cars on the way to school but you know what i never ever 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 before then or after heard them talk about lord ram or any other god never and it was the same with bjp supporters when i went to college that was when the babri masjid fell the safranites were never short of snarky comments about muslims in my college but i never saw them express or demonstrate any devotion to any god or any eagerness to go to any temple and there was nothing particularly dharmic or indic about these people and their families either they lived a life which was no different from any secular liberal family save in their abuse of muslims it was never about devotion to lord ram it was all all only and only about hindu chauvinism and insulting muslims how can anyone celebrate a temple built on the back of such lies violence spite and vengefulness how can this be squared with the teachings of hinduism let us accept that there was a cause for revenge in building this temple let us accept that there was a cause for revenge how is such a motivation of revenge and anger how is it justified in hinduism show me where hinduism tells you to take revenge and to act in anger show that to me take the bhagavad gita i hope those rejoicing at the building of this mandir consider the bhagavad gita to be a hindu text what does the gita say about morality in action it says that your acts can be moral only if you perform them selflessly in the spirit of duty as an offering to god and not to fulfill your desires and wishes according to the bhagavad gita no act of revenge or anger or with an eye to the fruits of action is a moral act karman ye vadikaraste ma phaleshu kadachana we all know this it's what the gita says 
Look at what the Gita says about anger, about acting in anger. Krodhat bhavati sammoha. Anger plunges you into maya, into delusion. Sammohat smriti vibrama. Delusion erases your smriti, your knowledge, whatever you have learnt, your shastras. Smriti brahmshad buddhi nasho. Once you forget your knowledge, you lose your mind. Buddhi nasho. Buddhi nashat pranashyati. Once you lose your mind, you are destroyed. The Gita starts with Arjun saying to Krishna that he does not want to fight. We know that famous scene. And what is Krishna's first response? You have to fight. Rise up warrior. Tasmad yudhasva bharata. Get up, you are a warrior. You must fight or you will be reviled by the world. This is the 18th shlok in the second chapter of the Gita. So if that is the simple message of the Gita, be a warrior, go and fight. Why does it carry on after that for 18 chapters? The simple answer is already given in Krishna's first reply. You have to fight this war. You can't just walk away. You can't think about whether it's your brother or your uncle. What more was there left to be said for the Gita to carry on for 16 chapters more? Does Krishna repeat his sayings about the duty of a warrior and how a king cannot run from the battlefield? No. The dialogue goes on and on and on for 16 more chapters because there is so much more to question about what is moral action? What is a dharm yudh? Because even when we breathe, the Gita says this, we kill so many tiny beings. So how can we humans ever speak of moral action? And all those 18 chapters, after the initial exchange, where the simple answer is given, you must, you must be a proud soldier, you must fight, you must do your duty as a soldier. The entire 18 chapters are a deep reflection on this question that... You must fight a dharam yudh, but what's a dharam yudh? And the answer that emerges is that you can never truly renounce action. You can never be free of karma. Simply by living, by existing, you perform karma. But equally, you must always be ethical in your karma, in your actions. And how do you do this? The answer of the Gita is... As to this question, how do you keep your moral purity while engaging in any act, whether it's eating or breathing or killing your brothers and uncles in a war? How do you maintain your moral purity when to act is inevitable? And the answer is what we call nishkama karma, acting without desire, without greed, without anger, without self-interest. Does a slogan like Mandir Vahi Banega strike you as anything but angry and vengeful? This is what the Gita says, the Mahabharat says about anger. A krodhin jayet krodham. Defeat anger with calm. Defeat krodh with a krodh. Asadhum sadhuna jayet. Defeat bad conduct with good conduct. Jayet kadaryam danen. Win over meanness, smallness with generosity, with giving, with charity. Jayet satyen chanritam. Defeat falsehood with the truth. This is how a Hindu is supposed to fight and conduct himself. Freeing himself from the maya of anger and never using, never using wrong action to counter what he believes is wrong action. And we all know Gandhiji's one of his favorite sayings, Ahimsa Parmo Dharma. 
मनुस्मृति इट्स द फैशन नाउ डेज टू लाफ एट द मनुस्मृति बट आई वुड बी हैप्पी इफ हिंदूज वुड फॉलो द मनुस्मृति बिकॉज इट्स फुल ऑफ मेनी थिंग्स इट डज नॉट ओनली टॉक अबाउट कास्ट ऑल द हिंदू स्क्रिप्चर्स टॉक अबाउट कास्ट so if that's going to be a criteria for us rejecting and 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 uh, mocking this then we have to reject all of them i say that if you want to if you want to be a hindu then be a hindu let's look at what the manusmriti says about the dashakam dharma lakshanam the 10 lakshan the principles of dharma dhritti patience kshama forgiveness damo astyam self restraint not to take that which is another's shocham purity indriya nigraha abstention sayam control restraint proportionality in action are you seeing any of that in what happened in the ram janma bhumi agitation and everything that has followed dhir vidya pursuit of knowledge satyam akrodho again and again it comes satyam akrodho renounce your anger akrodh akrodh and this is everywhere some people who i think there's a certain amount of confusion which has also uh, stepped in the mind of well meaning people in india you know they say that oh you know we are not taught the classics uh, the indian classics and we are away from our culture we don't have a limited um a cultural heritage like you see in the west where you have to be taught the classics frankly i met very few people in the west who actually had read the greek and the latin texts and there's a dispute also as to whether that's actually their inheritance or it's actually more connected with the orient anyway the point is that knowledge in the hindu system is preserved and passed on in many many ways Firstly there's an oral tradition. Secondly, if you participate in any of the any of the art forms of the subcontinent, each art form is a complete teaching of everything in itself. In fact, even our scriptures are like this. You know why they say that after you anybody who's read the Valmiki Ramayana you should touch their feet because they are very wise. I've read the Valmiki Ramayana. uh parts of it we um we performed it over 10 days once because the these all these scriptures even the bhagavad gita they don't you know unlike western knowledge forms they don't just explain one point they the valmiki ramayana is a description of an entire culture civilization everything with it from the landscape to the trees to the um to the sculpture so if you if you participate so if you go to a temple for instance the way in which our gods and goddesses are shown by the shilpakars in the old system the traditional system there is a serenity there is a serenity and a calm there's a message in in those statues just in the way in which the gods and goddesses the devis and devtas are um uh, represented this 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 smile it's neither ha 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 you know no no is it stern that smile is a very important message of hinduism so you don't have to be a vidwan in sanskrit and re- and be taught texts and all to know this to know to imbibe our hindu values you don't need any of it and what i find very ironical is what this regime is doing to our iconography the way in which you know they are showing these graphics and portraits of our different gods of lord shiva with the hair flying and the anger you know and the you know like like a it's this is not our iconography they are showing hanuman almost like he's a lion and growling this is not it you if you're concerned about our culture and about our civilization you should be looking at all of these things so for all these reasons i say that what is happening in ayodhya on january the 22nd and the entire build up to it that has been taking place is a lie 
It is a celebration of wickedness and it is a desecration of Hinduism and it is an affront to our civilizational heritage. And I am doing this fast as an act of protest and sorrow. I will start tomorrow. It will continue till Tuesday the 23rd because I don't want to break my fast on the day of, of, of uh, the production in Ayodhya. I will be taking liquids and some sugar and salt to keep my health in balance. And I have a few family matters to attend outside the house, which I will try to do. I hope that I, I will be able to do them. Otherwise, I will be at home and I will log on from time to time and we can keep talking. I'll do readings from Tagore, from Gandhi, from Martin Luther King in this deep time of despair and loss. Maybe we can find some Mark Darshan from the great people who have come from this land and who have been inspired by people from this land. Jai Hind.